Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm your host, Dr. Hedrasha. On behalf of Calvos, I would like to welcome all of you to this webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Today, we have another very interesting topic, and I'm really honored to welcome and introduce our distinguished guest speaker, who is going to talk about insights on how to choose the research methodology best suited for your research study. So today, we'll explore the key considerations and strategies to help you navigate the complex landscape of research methodologies, empowering you to make informed decisions that align with your studies, objectives, and requirements. Really very interesting topic. I'm sure you will learn a lot from this session because we have an expert with us in today's this session. So stay tuned because an amazing stuff are coming ahead in this session. So before we start, I would like to thank Kalwas for arranging such enlightenment sessions for their support and providing us such a wonderful platform. The aim of Kalwa is to give you the opportunity to connect and interact with world-renowned speakers, academic leaders, teachers, authors, researchers, experts, professionals, and businessmen to learn from their experiences, recommendations, suggestions, and uh, uh, experiences which will uh, give you the orientation regarding how to create an impact and will enable you to learn and develop yourself in order to grow and transform individually, as well as to contribute to the world in a positive as the slogan is calm, learn, and share not. So today we have an amazing person as guest. He is a well-known person in academia and industry with a vast experience from a leading institute. He is a great human being, a man uh, known for his contribution and hard work and always ready to share his knowledge. So let me introduce him formally. He is a senior lecturer at the Department of Education, School of Education and Social Sciences, Management, uh, Management and Science University, MSU. He got his PhD in Applied Linguistics from Faculty of Languages and the Linguistics, University of Malaya, Malaysia in 2017, which is one of the top universities of Malaysia. In a career spanning of 26 years, he has worked as an EFL and ESL senior lecturer, researcher, and curriculum developer in Iran, Turkey, Qatar, as well as in Malaysia. In addition to that, he has published and presented numerous research papers on his topic of interest, namely TSL, academic discourse. Uh, analysis, the crops, linguistic, educational technology, and English language teaching strategies in several prestigious journals, including the GMA Online, the Journal of Language Studies, UKM, the uh, UKM Malaysia, uh, in, along with that, the Asia ESP Journal, Asia EFL Journal Studies uh, in English Language and Education, World Journal of English Language and Education and Information Technology, Springer. Moreover, he is the editor of book, The Reconception of Policy Strategies and Challenges in Education 5.0. The book will be published by the IJ Global by the end of the 2024. Along with that, he has also been appointed as one of the International Advisory Board member of the International Journal of Modern Languages and Applied Linguistics, established by APB, University Technology Mara, Shalom, Malaysia. Last but not the least, he's a wonderful speaker, author, teacher, researcher, professional, and above everything, a great human being. So please help me in welcoming our guest, Dr. Ali Suraya Azar. Welcome to the Carlos Welcome, and thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Ali. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Haydasha. I, I think uh, those compliments and all those nice words and nice wishes from you, Dr. Haydasha, I think I am really humbled <laughs> and... Uh, also, I really thank you for the kind invitation. Also, the same as goes to your university and then uh, Institute of the related to the research. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Ali. Uh, you can call me also Dr. Azar. Uh, my ethnicity is Turkish. I am Turkish and uh, I got to know myself in Malaysia for almost 10 years. I think with the Dr. Haydasha, we were at the same university. Uh, we we had a very nice chat before joining to this uh, uh, international webinar about our old school days at the University of Malaya in Malaysia. So, um, as you know, University of Malaya is one of the best universities in terms of uh, uh, leader leader in research. We call it leader in research. Why leader in research? Because most of the experts and scholars and at the same time postgraduate students especially phd candidates all being trained how to be a researcher 
that is why I am here today. Uh, I am really humbled, actually, in front of Dr. Haydasha. Dr. Haydasha himself is a great researcher, actually. So I am going to give my lessons back to him. <laughs> so yeah. without further ado, uh, welcome, Dr. Yeah. Haydasha. It's a really so, pleasure to have you, Dr. Azhar, with us. And uh, we will be discussing those good old days uh, in University of Malaya, where we spent a wonderful time and exactly. we trained in a very good way. And that's why we have this uh, 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 intention to share and spread our knowledge so that anyone can get benefit out of it. So over to you. Thank exactly. you very much. Bro. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Itasha. Okay, let me share. Okay, already the, as you see, my slides are here. Well, uh, Dr. Haydasha sent me an invitation for this international webinar. So as I told you, um, this university in Malaysia, University of Malaya, are very strict in terms of doing and conducting research and projects, honestly, to be honest with you. And our supervisors here, very strict and very well disciplined. And before going to my main topic, I want to tell you just a very short story what happened to me during my supervision session with my supervisor. Uh, one day, uh, both of us, Dr. Haydasha and me, were living in one college. At the University of Malaya, the dormitories called college. Maybe in some uh, countries like Britain, United States college means something like university or smaller than university. But here, the college means dormitory inside the campus. So we were living in the same college and I had to go to visit my supervisor in order to submit my research project report. That is one of the steps and uh, processes that uh, any researcher should be involved in. It means that submitting project reports, even progress reports in order to show the researcher, the supervisor, that I am on the line, I am on the right track. So that is one of our responsibilities, actually. That is a very good step. And sometimes this step, very informative step, because when we are on the wrong track, the supervisor can drag us to bring to the right track. And that is very important for any researcher to see that this research is on the right track or not. So actually, that made this short story related to our topic. When I met, started to step in my supervisor's room, and uh, Dr. Haytasha knows that our supervisors are very strict, and then uh, very difficult to get also make arrangement time to meet them <laughs> because all the time they are busy with research and different different projects. The time that I stepped in my supervisor's room. Uh, she looked at me uh, in, a, in a very uh, strange look and a very strict look. And uh, she, she talked to me in, a, in such a manner, in such a tone that, Ali, why you were not in a very well-disciplined and well-ordered uh, attire today? So <laughs> I, was, uh, I was rushing to submit my report, you know, but uh, my supervisor gave a very you know, important warning to me that when a researcher wants to be on the right track, everything should be well-organized, well-disciplined, and systematic. So from that time onwards, you know, these steps kind of training for us, you know, they trained us to be a researcher. So I want to back to my topic again. When we are coming to the research, let's give a very simple definition or scientific simple definition for our research. What is research, first of all? If we want to look at the lexical meaning of the research, it says research is systematic scientific investigation. So each of these concepts, if you look at systematic, systematic, a very deep meaning, you know, when we are looking at systematic, systematic means it should be well organized, well disciplined. And not only the topic, not only the project itself, the same is true to the goes to the researcher himself or herself. The researcher should be well organized, punctual. The researcher should have time management. The researcher should have a very deep knowledge about what he or she is going to do. 
about the route or the road that we are going to choose. And at the same time, these steps should be scientific. It means that we need to be aligned with all the principles and rules and regulations that in science and science telling us what to do, what not to do. Then we have systematic steps, systematic steps to conduct the research. So back to the title that we uh, decided, uh, according to Dr. Haydar Shah's invitation, he invited me for this international webinar, thanks to him and thanks to his university, and then about the uh, all the steps and protocols that being taken. The title goes to choosing the right research methodology. When we are talking about right research methodology, it doesn't mean that, okay, I should I do for example, quantitative or qualitative. That's not only that matter. It means coming back to the same systematic and scientific investigation. These two, three concepts, we need always put it on the uh, notebook, notice board in front of our eyes and see scientific, systematic, scientific investigation. So this is how we keep us, these concepts keep us on the right track to be on the right research methodology. So the subtitle that I have here, a guide to enhancing research quality. So when we are talking about these things, then definitely we will, we will be enhanced to have a very quality, good quality work. Uh, here, very good uh, figure. I, I, I like this figure, to be honest with you all audience, my dear uh, audience today. Uh, in this uh, simple figure, we can see different types of the research methodologies. Uh, if I can uh, divide this page or this slide into two uh, halves, uh, at the top and the bottom, you can see at the top, all we have, we have qualitative research designs like historical research, for example, uh, ethnography or ethnographic. If you go down, scroll down, or the, 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 the second half, at the bottom, you have, for example, cause and effect connections or correlation research or single case or case study, simple, single subject or experimental research. So this simple figure sh showing us that, okay, which road I need to take, this road or that road, which one I, we, uh, which one I needed in order to align, to, uh, to align with my, for example, own research. So in order to start my research or my talk my talk today the main purpose of my talk is to highlight the importance of research methodology as i told you determining the validity reliability and credibility of the research findings and at the same at the same time i'd like to go to the philosophy of the research what is what, what are the philosophies behind our research designs and methodologies like, for example, positivism and interpretivism, that we need to have a clear picture which one we want to take and uh, in order to be on the right track, okay? So let's go to the, the first step, understanding your research question and research objective. Sometimes in some universities, based on the policies or protocols, they ask us, okay, put the research question first and then research objective or vice versa, first research objective or research question. I just want to tell you that don't be confused. It depends on the policies and protocols of the universities. So here at University of Malay in Malaysia, we, we learned that we need to put first research objectives. So but, uh, to de develop your research objective and based on your research objectives, you need to develop your research questions. So you need to have a clear uh, picture about what you are going to do. What is the aim of the project that you are going to conduct? So, <coughs> so clearly, you need to articulate the aim and purpose of the research that you are going to do. That's very important. Uh, what is the aim and what is the main purpose? So if you have a clear purpose, definitely after that, the next step will go uh, clearly. If you have a very blurred objective, not clear aim or objective, then definitely the steps, the next steps will go in a very wrong way. And it is not clear, it will be blurred. So when you uh, start to develop your objective, definitely after that, it will come the research question. 
Let's go to the example, for example. There is a research question here. What factors influence consumer preferences in the smartphone market? Let's see that this is our question. So based on this question that we have developed already, we need to know that, first of all, okay, is there any cause and effect relation here that we need to find out and analyze it? And uh, we need to make sure that this research question is specific enough. Is it aligned with my context? And sometimes when we are developing our objectives, the aim of our research, we are very too general. It is too broad. We need to break it down, make it specific in order to target the place, especially when we are, for example, going to any research, conduct any research. Sometimes I, based on my experience, I am looking at my postgraduate or my PhD supervisor's, for example, proposal, I see that the research question is very general, too general. The setting missing, participants missing. We want to target whom? It's not clear. We want to do conduct this message where? It is not clear. So in order to avoid all these things, better to bring the setting, participants, who you are going to target, where you are going to target, what you are going to do, repeat and answer five or six critical questions who where what and so on and so forth so ensure your research questions is specific measurable achievable relevant and time bound i made a short acronym here and that is smart so specific measurable achievable relevant and time bound these five criteria okay make our question very clear specific and you know that okay what i am going to do and how i am going to target my participants in my setting the next step that is going to put us on the right track is our literature don't forget literature review very important and it has several functions in our research when we are reviewing existing literature, definitely there are several functions. One of the functions, maybe you can see in the first bulleted phrase, it says that helps, helps the researcher identify gaps in knowledge and informs methodological choices. That is very famous one and very common one when we are going to do literature review. Okay, when we are reading the previous works and our pioneers that already opened the road to open the roots to us in order to take our steps and conduct any research, definitely we need to go back to their works and review the literature. When we are reviewing the literature, we can get there, we can identify the gaps. What have been discovered and what have not been discovered, what have been found and what have not been found. Definitely we need this in order to bring it as a kind of a very strong point. We call it CARS, created a research space for your own research. If you don't have this kind of space, the examiners, the panel will ask you why you are going to conduct this research. What is the purpose? Uh, if, if, for example, a kind of replication, if it's a kind of repeated work, definitely your research will be under question. So we need to identify gaps and highlight it. This highlighting gap also kind of a significance for our research because we can inform the reader, the examiner that that is the important part of my research that I am going to do. So definitely that will be very important for your research. So identification of the gaps is number one point that we are going to review our existing literature. The next function going to inform me, inform you, inform the researcher what kind of research frameworks and research structures or research designs already being introduced to the world. And when I am going to do this research, I am going to inform the reader that it is not only me that I am going to do this research. The previous pioneers and previous researchers, like our parents of this course community members, already opened this road. And that is a very well-structured road. 
It is not only me that I am going to go and take my steps on this road. That is another significance for your research. That's a kind of backup to your research to show that my structure, my framework is not the only framework that is going to happen. Yes, in PhD program journeys, we need to introduce a new program, a new platform, a new framework. But each part of this framework or platform or model should have a support and backup based on theoretical uh, theories, bit one theories, bit one theoretical literature review. So we should have and bring back our backup from the literature. If you go to the example here, for example, Examples of methodologies used in similar studies, like analyzing how previous researchers approach similar topics. So when we are showing that these similar topics already done, maybe in my context is, has not been done, that is my gap or that is my niche area. So that is the significance of your research. And also revealing previous studies, use surveys and focus groups, what kind of instruments previous researchers already use what kind of, uh, for example, questionnaires previous researchers use, and considering all these strengths and weaknesses of the methodologies that in the previous works maybe we have identified. So that's the kind of, again, problem or any issue that you have identified in the literature. So reviewing existing literature also is a very important and one of the factors that always keep us on the right track. The next is epistemological stance that we need to consider all the time. If we define epistemology, let's go to the positivist and interpretivist and critical points of views. In epistemology, shapes that how we want to view knowledge acquisition. It shows the view that how we are looking, the perspectives that what we have done or what we have taken. In positivist approach, that definitely it emphasizes objectivity and generalizability and whereas in interpretivist approach we look at only subject re subjective realities so in uh, epistemological stance that we want to consider definitely influences the types of data that we want to collect okay and what we want to prioritize and how we want to interpret this kind of data Let's go to the foundational differences between these two perspectives. One, we want to look at the, for example, positivism and another philosophy of the research, especially in education, for example, it is interpretivism. So foundational differences lie definitely in ontological nature of reality and epistemological nature of knowledge. These two beliefs definitely uh, going to establish these foundational differences in our research. If we look at positivism, for example, positivism focuses on objective realities, while uh, interpretivism recognizes subjective realities, multiple subjective realities. Let me give a clear example. For example, here, if uh, I want to clarify more about interpretivism, uh, we are in interpretism, we want to focus on more to our understandings, people's understandings. It looks like that we want to go to people's minds to see that how they understand about their challenges or experiences or issues that they have encountered or faced during their life, social life. So when we are going to interpretism, definitely we want to do qualitative research. We, we want to do interpretism, interpretism focusing on the subjective realities. That is why it is subjective realities, because we are focusing on the processes, we are focusing on the meanings, we are focusing on the issues, beliefs, and norms. The core principle, again, in positivism, that it relies on belief in an objective reality existing independently of the perception. So it means that without any biased thoughts of the researcher, okay, focusing only on the objective reality. Two plus two equals four, that's it. Very simple and very logical. Then it seeks universal truth through empirical observation contributing to a scientific and systematic understanding of phenomena. It doesn't mean that interpretism is not a scientific and systematic understanding. 
Interpretarianism has its own scientific understanding, but in another road, in different road. When we go to the researcher's role in this kind of philosophy, and I mean positivism, definitely in positivism, the researcher plays a neutral role, an objective role. We don't have, well, we don't want to import or interfere in the analysis. That is beyond and avoiding any biased thoughts, any biased interference. Striving to eliminate biases and personal values. The focus here is only on maintaining a scientific stance to ensure objectivity, reliability, and replicability in the research process. What we mean here when we are going to focus on pre uh, positivism, definitely the focus is on objective role of the uh, researcher, and we want to eliminate the biases. But when we are coming to the interpretivism, you will see that uh, more to people's ideas, more to people's opinions and feedbacks. Definitely when we come to people's opinions and ideas, subjectivity is there. But when we come to the positivism, objectivity is there because everything based on the numerical data, as I told you, 2 plus 2 equals 4. So in interpretism, the core principle acknowledges multiple subjective realities and socially constructed nature of reality. Why socially constructed? Because the researcher wants to go to the real life situations and find out what is happening among the people's minds. We want to indirectly go to the people's minds to see that how their understanding is about that kind of issue in their life, for example. How their understanding is about that kind of, for example, social problem is in their mind. So that is why it is totally about, related about subjective realities. So socially constructed nature of reality that I explain why we want to go to the real life situations of people. It values qualitative methods. Definitely, when we are talking about the philosophy of this research, this kind of philosophy, I mean interpretism, definitely we are focusing on what? We are focusing on the qualitative research methods. In qualitative research methods, we are more with people during the interviewing session, for example. We want to elicit their ideas, their views and opinions. And then we want to see what kind of understanding they have towards, for example, one kind of issue in society. So we focus on this. We focus on individual meanings in their experiences and also their interpretations within specific context. So interpretation here is very important because this is more to subjectivity, don't forget. The researcher's role, what is the researcher's role in interpretivism? In interpretivism, the researcher is actively involved in the research process. Definitely, when we are looking at the qualitative research designs and methods, the role of researcher here is very important. I, for, I don't forget always that the attributes, one of the important attributes of, for example, qualitative research is the researcher itself. We consider the researcher as one of the instruments in qualitative research methodology or research designs. Why? He or she should be very skillful and he or she should be aware how to elicit data from the people through interviewing, through maybe observation. So it is involved in the research process, acknowledging their subjectivity. The emphasis is on empathy, understanding, the unique perspectives of participants. When we are talking about empathy, means that we need to look at the issues of the society from their perspectives, from their glasses, from their eyes. We need to put ours into their shoes to see that how they experience these kind of challenges, how these issues are going to be involved in their life. We cannot come to this level except we need to go and look at from their eyes. How it is happened, how, how it is uh, possible, okay, we need to go and live with them 
interview, ask questions directly. Maybe some of you uh, raised this question that, uh, Dr. Ali, Dr. Azar, uh, don't we get these ideas through questionnaire? Through questionnaire, no. We cannot get in detail because in questionnaire, we don't have open-ended questions. We have closed questions. When closed questions, we have already limited the participants. When, when we are doing interview, there is a open-ended questions, means that we have opened the gate for the participants to tell us whatever he feels, to tell us whatever she feels. So that is how going to be focused on empathy. That is what here the concept exactly means. And understanding the unique perspectives of participants. This understanding very important. If the, according to Bloom's taxonomy, if you remember, we have several layers in one pyramid or one triangle. The basic layers and levels of Bloom's taxonomy is understanding. If we cannot get this understanding, never ever you can come up to the level of analysis and evaluation. So based on this, you need to have a clear and clear understanding, clear picture of the uh, participants, the perspectives of the participants. And recognizing the researcher's influence on the study. Here, according to interpretism philosophy of research, the researcher roles here is exactly the uh, role that he or she should recognize his own role. Imagine, for example, in one interview, if the interviewer cannot play appropriately, accordingly, never ever he or she can elicit the information from the interviewee. So that is why it is important the relationship between interviewer and interviewee so one of the another another attribute of the qualitative research methods or research designs is the relationship between researcher and the participant or interviewer and interviewee that is very important that you need to always keep it in mind okay the next if i am not mistaken yes the next slide goes to the a little bit the comparative looks and perspectives between these two types of the philosophies in research between uh, positivism and interpretivism and also the, therefore it leads us to the research designs and methodologies like quantitative research and qualitative. First let's look at the philosophies. Okay. In positivism, that it employs quantitative methods like what, like ex experiments, like surveys for objective and measurable data. Le re remember, measurable data, it means that the data is numerical data, not categorical data or not nominal data, and emphasizing replicability. Whereas in interpretism, uh, in interpretism, we use qualitative research methods such as interview or interview to collect data and observations. And also at the same time, we have focus groups. Even we have uh, in uh, qualitative research methods, we have documentary analysis or in my own field that uh, my major actually is, uh, my main uh, expertise is discourse analysis. But definitely we have content analysis or discourse analysis that is part of qualitative research methods. So when we are doing these things, what we are aiming for? Aiming for in-depth understanding. Again, it is repeated here. So one of the main concepts in qualitative research methods, don't forget it is understanding, depth understanding, depth description. So it is context specific insights. Another inter uh, attribute of the qualitative research method is context, the importance of context. If we cannot drive the information based on the cultural perspectives and contextual perspectives, definitely our data is not accurate and we need to go to the second round of maybe interview, second round of observation. That is how is also going to be different between this kind of method and that kind of method. It means in qualitative methods, qualitative research designs, when we are asking for interview, sometimes the researcher may notice that, oh, 
this uh, data is not saturated. So I need to ask for the second round of interview. So that is happening. But in the quantitative research methods, uh, one shot, we want to collect data through questionnaire from 500, 600 participants and everyone answering unique questions with unique answers. You see the difference, right? In the quantitative research methods, we have one instrument, a unique one, a questionnaire. Let's say 35 questions should answer these 35 questions and the answers very close. I mean, maybe five point Likert scale there it is, or seven point Likert scale, there it is. Everyone has strongly agreed to this, strongly disagree. So we have definitely unique answers. We, we are not uh, free and we are not unlimited to go beyond these answers. But whereas in interview, our participants and interviewee uh, free and uh, we have open-ended questions. So definitely he or she will give us a lot of uh, opinions and ideas so that's why it is it can be driven and elicited contextual perspectives and cultural perspectives from our interviewers and participants points of views when we come to the uh, the next slide we want to compare the qualitative quantitative and qualitative approach together to see that how it is going to be different from each other if we go to the uh, definition of quantitative and qualitative methods. In quantitative methods that we want to involve the researcher and the participants more with numerical data, while in qualitative methods, the main focus is on non-numerical data. As, you, as uh, I explained, in uh, qualitative, we are more with understandings of the people. We are more with the people's ideas and opinions. Whereas in quantitative research methods, uh, researcher more with numerical data through the questionnaire, right? The questionnaire, when we collect the questionnaire with the, our participants' responses, we will bring our to our office and we will convert the data from their answers into numbers. For example, participant one answered for, for example, question one, strongly agree. So we will usually have one standard converting numbers, for example, strongly agree equals to five, for example. Strongly disagree equals to one. So participant one for question one answered strongly agree. So when it is strongly agree, definitely it equals five. Or no, participant two answered strongly disagree. So strongly disagree equals to one. So this way we need to create our raw data table in order to have uh, a kind of convert converting our answers into numbers so later on it will be uh, typed and keyed in the SPSS for example in order to have our numerical data analysis in quantitative like surveying a smartphone users to collect numerical data for example this is an example or determine which approach aligns best with your research question and objectives when we are going to see that okay this objective wants to go to their, for example, participants' experiences or challenges or, for example, ideas. So when we are going to be focused on the ideas, understanding and participants' challenges, experiences, definitely we need to develop our objectives and research questions based on our qualitative method. But when we are going to look at the cause and effect relationship, when we are going to see that what is the Im impact of Im variable A on variable B, definitely there is a kind of cause and effect relationship and we need to do this as quantitative research method. And maybe we will bring our hypothesis in order to set uh, forward to see that this hypothesis or our prediction is correct or not correct. So a little bit uh, differences are here, maybe in the next uh, slide, you will see a kind of clear figure between two types of research design or research approaches. On the right side, you have qualitative research method or research approach. And on the left side, you will have on the scale quantitative research method. Okay, let's start with the qualitative research method. When we are looking at the, the type of the data in qualitative research method, 
you will see that, okay, it is considered as unstructured data. And let's say, okay, uh, we don't know any idea about what unstructured data is. As I explained it, um, when we go to the each interviewee in order to interview, because we are on the qualitative research method, so we want to interview our interviewee, or we want to observe, or we want to uh, go through these steps, definitely our interviewee uh, will be questioned based on the open-ended questions. What is your idea? What's your experience? What kind of challenges you, for example, face? These kinds of questions considered open-ended questions. Why open-ended? Because the interviewee or our participants are free to give their experiences, share their experiences with us, or explain more in depth about their ideas. So it is not limited. When, for example, it is limited, we call these kinds of questions close-ended questions. Means that we have limited our participants to their, towards their answers. Either we have yes, yes or no, true or false, or we have uh, uh, our five-point Likert scales. They cannot move beyond these answers because it is unique and already decided. So structured questions are there. But when we are coming to qualitative research, the data are considered unstructured because when we go to interview number one, maybe interview number one, very talkative person, and when we are setting or raising the question, he or she will give us one paragraph answer or one page answer. But in interviewee two, when we are asking or raising question, he will give us only two sentences. So as you see, this is kind of unstructured data. The data is not structured like quantitative research. As you see, on the opposite side of the scale, we have quantitative research method, and that is structured data. The data is structured, unique, well-disciplined, and all of the participants answering the same questions, the same unique format, and with the same answers. Sometimes in the interview, maybe you, the interviewer might notice that my participant or my interviewee didn't get what I am asking. So me as the researcher or interviewer might add a lot of or more clarification to my questions. So this kind of uh, the protocol of the interview, so that is leading us on a structured data. The next attribute of the quant co these research methods going to showing that uh, it is in based on summarizing in qualitative research, summarizing, description, explanation, whereas in quantitative research we have a statistical analysis. So in qualitative, because we are more with words, we are more on meanings, we are more with the uh, people's ideas and opinions. Definitely, we need to explain, we need to interpret, we need to explain. When we are coming to the opposite side, I mean quantitative research method, our data is numerical data. So we need to go and do statistical analysis, either descriptive analysis or inferential analysis. You will start with frequency, mean, standard deviation, and maybe you will come to the t-test, comparing to two groups, independent t-test, or maybe regression, factorial analysis, and so forth, so on. so on. So when we are comparing these kinds of data analysis, definitely totally different nature, totally different types. So you need to decide, okay, I am going to more to people's ideas or opinions, then I need to explain more go more deeper and interpret, go more deeper, summarize their ideas and discuss and argue. Or no, I want to go more to, for example, data analysis in terms of numerical data and go to the statistics to see that what is the impact of this variable on that variable, causal relationships. So this is a kind of decision that you need to decide. How you should decide, as I told in the, on the first slides, first few slides, it is based on your objectives. It is based on the road that you are taking. The next attribute goes to subjective conclusions. Definitely, as I explained before, in qualitative research, right, 
your conclusions won't, won't be subjective. But in quantitative research, it is objective. Why objective? Because we understand the equation, we understand the formulas, we understand adding and deducting, and 2 plus 2 equals 4. That is objective. But when we are coming to the opinions, not facts, okay, it is subjective. And we cannot say that this person is right, that person is wrong. So based on that, this is more to subjectivity. So subjective realities are here. And don't forget that when we are choosing qualitative research methods, the rate of subjectivity very high. And that is why the researchers here should be very skillful researcher in order to avoid a lot of comments and questioning about the project, about the research that doing. So subjectivity, when there it is, we need to be very careful. So we need to take some uh, very, uh, very careful steps in order to reduce the subjectivity. Maybe, inshallah, later in other uh, webinars, we will go more to reliability and validity of our concepts to see that how we can reduce the subjectivity of our research. And the opposite scale, as I told you, the objective conclusion are there. So definitely objectivity is up. The rate is very high. And then uh, based on this calculations, based on this numerical data, definitely our explanations also more to objectivity. In qualitative research, again, the ways that we want to collect data, it is more to interview participants, focus groups, and observations. A little, uh, I need to open a bracket here, the difference between interviews and focus groups. In definitely, uh, there is a difference. In interviews, we are going to interview our interviewers one-to-one, -one, okay? But in focus groups, we have a group of, uh, for example, experts in one room, in one, uh, around one desk. So we have panel discussion. We raise our questions as a researcher, and we draw back and then put the question on the table. Then the experts, maybe six to 10 people, start to discuss and starts to argue, starts to raise the questions, start to explain about their ideas and views. That is considered as focus groups. Definitely, there are some advantages, pros and cons in interviews and focus groups that we need to consider. But if you want to, for example, go to the issues, for example, goes to the issues of the some certain high schools in one city, uh, if I consider, I would go to focus groups. I will invite several principals of these schools and bring them in one uh, thought room and raise the questions and start focus groups and raise questions and uh, ask them that, okay, let's discuss. Observations definitely go to become participant or non-participant observation. When we go to the real life situations, we want to observe people. Sometimes these people should be informed that we are observing. Sometimes no need. It is indirectly observation. We are part of the group that is participant or we are not part of the group. We are not participants or non-participant observation. These are the strategies or methods that we can collect our data based on our objectives. And on the opposite scale, we have surveys and experiments. If we want to do experiments like, for example, biologists or medical scientists, definitely we have laboratories and workshops. And we need to go inside our laboratories and we have our own settings. And in, when we have laboratories, definitely the setting being manipulated and changed. But sometimes when we do surveys, okay, we will go to the real life situations that just uh, our questionnaire being in, in, uh, distributed in order to collect data and back to the office and analyze their data. I think this figure uh, in a, a very clear cut and very crystal picture showing us the differences between these two types of research methods. But as I told you before, before coming to these differences, we need to choose our road to see that which road we need to take in order to uh, choose our research design. Mixed methods approach considered here uh, combination of the, for example, uh, qualitative and qualitative. So we need to consider which method we need to go forward, either qualitative or quantitative. Sometimes some researchers 
prefer to start with qualitative research first and then go to the quantitative. Make sure that uh, in some uh, very serious, especially in PhD journeys, we need to have mixed methods. Why? Because sometimes only quantitative not enough. And in order to do triangulation and make our data very stronger, other parts of our research is very important to bring it in. So definition of mixed methods, let's go to the some simple definitions here. Combination or combining quantitative and qualitative techniques to gain a comprehensive understanding. Uh, I can give a clear example here. Let's say that I am doing quantitative. And I have a questionnaire in order to collect my data. But I have a question in my mind always. Okay, I, nowadays technology always in and we are using, for example, social medias and like WhatsApp group, telegrams in order to distribute our links, our survey form links. Okay, so the first question, how do you know that the opposite addressee is a human that answering your questionnaire? We are not aware because we just distributed our link through the social media and we are not aware that uh, my addressee or opposite person is a human or non-human. Maybe is a robot that answering my questions. That is one of the pros and cons of the quantitative research that's going to be done by questionnaire. Sometimes questionnaire also when we are distributing to our participants, uh, they are not giving us their honest answers. This happened to me at the University of Malaya when I went uh, to, to go and meet my supervisor. I was in rush. One of my ex-classmates asked me, Ali, I have this, I had this questionnaire. Please answer, please help me. I was shy to reject actually this request. But uh, at the same time, I couldn't say no. And the other side, my supervisor waiting for me, as I told you, they are very strict and they are all, they are very punctual. So I had to accept my friend's request, but with this idea that I am rushing and I need to reach my meeting. So honestly, I couldn't understand what the questions are. Just put agree, 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 disagree, disagree. And I apologize to my classmates. You see that these kinds of things happening, honestly, when we are going to distribute our questionnaire. So the disadvantages and, dis uh, advantages and disadvantages of the questionnaires also are there. So in order to avoid this kind of errors, human errors or non-human errors, definitely we need another part in our doing research, and that is, for example, qualitative. When we, when we go and target one-to-one -one interviewing sessions, Definitely, we can get exact ideas and opinions of our participants when we do interview. So they can give us very good answers, okay? So based on that, uh, I'll prefer to do mixed method. And also, and also for example, um, bring the, another scale to the, my research to say that how to get very strong, for example, uh, information from the insights also, research insights also from the uh, people, from uh, participants. Survey data combined with the in-depth interviews for a comprehensive understanding. And as I explained, this is going to provide a kind of triangulation and richer insights. And mixed methods approaches offer flexibility. And uh, also don't forget that sometimes these uh, triangulation sometimes can, should be repeated. For example, qualitative first, quantitative second, again, qualitative or no. First quantitative and then qualitative and then again qualitative. These steps and protocols based on the objectives and research questions that you have set already for your project. Don't forget ethical considerations in our uh, doing research that we are going to make it more stronger. Importance of ethical guidelines, very important. Ensure research is conducted ethically and uh, respects. Also participants' uh, rights always there. Example of ethical issues, informed consent is there and protect participants from harm. And uh, sorry, in this uh, slide a little bit, because when we, I think, converted to this system, a little bit lines going to be crazy here. Ensure voluntary participation 
Uh, sometimes anonymity, anonymous uh, participations or participants should be considered in sensitive research or a smartphone addiction, for example. That's an example. Ethical considerations should be integrated into every stage of the research pro process. Definitely, I am sure that when you are going to conduct your research project, especially PhD journeys or PhD candidates, there, uh, the first step is get approval from uh, ethics uh, committee of the university before approaching people to collect data, before approaching the uh, participants to, for example, interview. So ethics approval form should be done and you should have ethics number and then you can approach participants in order to get and uh, uh, collect your data. This section goes to tell especially uh, tell us, especially the PhD uh, candidates, what to uh, bring into their consideration always. And that is what is always we uh, uh, give this alarm or this kind of uh, warning points that don't go solo on the research without consideration, without consulting your supervisors and experts. Even I remember, not only me, I am sure that Dr. Haydasha also agrees with me. Um, we always wanted to consider the second mind, the third mind, the fourth mind, that we are on the right track or not. I myself, not only asking several times my supervisor, I had to write emails to several experts in the world, in different countries, to ask about my research design, research framework, to see that I am on the right track or not. That is very important, consulting with experts. Value of seeking expert advice is very important, and experts can provide insights always. We are always most welcome to all of us, and uh, we try our best to guide and put you on the clear picture to say that what kind of research methods, what kind of research design you need to take, and what kind of decisions you have to make. Consulting a methodological expert for guidance on survey design. Sometimes, to be honest, nobody is perfect. We need to accept. We need to see that, okay, in one area I am an expert, but in another area I am not expert. So if I don't know, I need to go and ask. Even I go to my colleagues, I ask, sorry, what is this area about? I want to have a clear picture. If, for example, I am not expert in statistics, definitely I need uh, an expert in statistics to come to guide me and advise me. Uh, we, we, we usually have, for example, advisor or co-supervisor. That is why these two or three supervisors being combined in one project in order to guide the uh, participants, guide the researchers, sorry, guide their PhD candidates appropriately. So engage with colleagues, mentors, methodological experts to enhance the rigor and validity of your research. That is very important that you need to consider and take into your consideration. Well, here we have another point and element that makes our research more stronger and tell us that we are on the right track or not, that is pilot studies. So purpose of pilot studies, first of all, test research instruments, yes. When we are choosing any research instrument, we need to make sure that this research instrument is uh, reliable and valid. So validity and reliability of that instrument should be evaluated. We cannot say that, okay, because those researchers already use this research instrument, I can take it and bring it into my context and use it very simply. Please don't take it simply like this, okay? So when you are taking any instrument, either you adopt or adapt, okay, you need to do pilot study. That is a must. So you need to test your research instrument and procedures that uh, doing this research instrument that is called pilot study, you need to be very full aware of it, and the uh, full scale of implementation of that should be there. Conducting a small scale survey to test questionnaire clarity and response rate is very important. For example, when I am going to test my 
instrument, research instrument. For example, I have a questionnaire. I need to do pilot test and come to the range of Kronbach Alpha to see that the, my research instrument is in the range of Kronbach Alpha or not. So that is reliability test that I need to do. So based on that, then we will go more deeper to say that, okay, what about the items? What about the questions? Is there any face validity, content validity? So these coordination and item analysis should be done in order to make sure that your research instrument is valid and reliable enough to go to the main data collection step. So when, before coming to the main step of the data collection, your research instrument should be available and ready. So when you are sure that your research instrument is clear enough, is ready enough, and uh, is, it is valid and reliable, that is also another assurance that you are on the right track. You are going to collect the main data appropriately and accordingly. So pilot studies help identify and address potential issues early in the research process. Imagine you have not done this alignment, you have not done this kind of pilot study, and you have collected your main data, and you have come to the main finding. Suddenly, examiner or your supervisor notice that, oh, your findings, some part, have, have gone wrongly. So what, what happens? It means that waste of time, waste of energy, you need to redo. That is the worst scenario of any PhD journey's story. So that's why pilot study is very important in order to give us clear picture and address potential issues. That is very important. Don't forget, not only in quantitative research methods or research design, in qualitative research designs, also we have pilot studies. Don't be confused. Don't say that I am doing interviews or there is no pilot study. For both research design, research methods, we have pilot studies, but the nature of these pilot studies or evaluation of the research instruments, evaluating and arranging or measuring their reliability, totally different. Definitely in quantitative, it is based on numerical data. In qualitative, it is based on categorical and nominal data. So for qualitative research design, when we are going to do interview, definitely for interview questions also, we have uh, reliability tests, but it is more on protocol, its own protocol, that you need to consult with your supervisor and experts to see that how you are going to do and evaluate the reliability of your questionnaires. Another element that I am going to highlight here is flexibility of the researcher. Don't forget that uh, adaptability and the flexibility in research very important. Okay, sometimes um, I'll give a. I, I want to share a kind of a true story here. One of my supervisors uh, uh, had to go to one of the schools in Malaysia to collect data from the school level. It was a government school. But uh, unfortunately, at the last minute, the principal of the school didn't accept my supervisor's uh, data collection. So imagine what happens. So my supervisor very sad and uh, very upset because it was the time of, uh, due to, uh, the, you know, that limitation and time limitation is there. So he had to, he, she had to go and collect the data, but unfortunately couldn't reach to the main data after maybe, for example, six or seven months waiting. So very late and uh, she had to immediately, we had to immediately change her research design. So this is adaptability or flexibility that I am talking. In research is very important, okay? So be prepared to adjust your methodology based on finding sometimes, based on the emerging challenges, based on the issues, or another example, one of my supervisors wanted to collect data from internship or practicum students at the university level. She was a little bit slow and late. And when she started to collect data, already internship students already said goodbye to the university. So internship students were not present anymore. 
So these are some challenges that coming and popping up on the road of the doing conducting any research. So the researcher should be adaptable and flexible enough. So adjusting sampling strategy based on initial survey results. Flexibility allows researchers to refine their approach and optimize data collection methods. So don't forget when you are flexible and adaptable, you are going to optimize your data collection methods. When there is any challenge, any issue, so you need to uh, be flexible and adaptable to these kinds of issues and challenges that already uh, you have been encountered. So I am coming to wrap up my speech for today. Uh, choosing the right methodology is essential for all of us. You know that when we choose the wrong method, wrong design, definitely everything goes wrong. So for very strong research outcome, we need to choose a right methodology. And uh, choosing right methodology, methodology that we want to make our decisions definitely impact the credibility and reliability of our findings. That is very important. And uh, when we refine the understand, our understanding of the research methodology, this enhances the quality of our work. Okay? So definitely we are looking for the quality. Okay? The quality of work is very important for all of your supervisors and examiners. Imagine that when the, the examiner and supervisor notice that, okay, the examiners notice that the quality of the work is there, but somehow a little bit some research uh, partially here and there wrong, definitely we have positive ideas about that research. But when we find that in any research paper, any research project, any PhD, thesis, the quality of work is not there, definitely the uh, decision is a bit tough and strict. So um, based on this, I can come to this conclusion that selecting a correct research methodology, okay, uh, increasing the validity and reliability of your research. Thank you very much for today's uh, uh, webinar, international webinar. I really uh, thank you all ladies and gentlemen that, that listened to my speech. And again, thanks to Dr. Haydar Shah and uh, his university and his uh, research association that invited me tonight for this international webinar. My name is uh, Ali, Dr. Ali S. Azar. You can call me also Dr. Azar. My pen name is uh, Dr. Azar. So, uh, I am uh, a senior lecturer at Management and Science University in Malaysia. So any question, any points, any suggestions, you are most welcome. I am all ears. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Azar. Really very interesting and lovely presentation you have given. And I like the way yeah. you just started your presentation with the definition of research first, that you established the notion first. And very nicely, you have quoted the University of Malaya that uh, how you have been shaped and trained over there. Even you have given the example of your own that you were rushed in the meeting with the supervisor and even they were particular regarding your attire. Uh, this is how great, you have great. been shaped. Yeah. Dr. So Hidesha, like I just want to highlight one point. When we are overseas, okay, some of my colleagues also happen to me also. Some of our yeah. friends or colleagues or even um, some friends, maybe some relatives, they might think that we are in overseas and we are at the age, at the highest level of uh, happiness and doing everything here with happiness here, there. <laughs> We are at the beaches, at the seaside, and we are enjoying <laughs> our lives here. But when they are coming inside this zone, okay, I mean the research zone, they honestly, if someone is, is not inside this zone, never ever feels this kind of pain that we feel or we, we experience already. That is not a pain actually, but that is a kind of strict pressure and uh, also maybe sometime anxiety that we had. I never ever forgot those days that I was at the dormitory or at the college 
and all of us were under stress. That was a stressful life. And uh, when I was mm -hmm. hearing all these stories behind myself that, yes, you are at overseas and uh, enjoying your life, you're at the seaside doing this, doing that, I was very <laughs> upset and to say that, what kind of perspective with this? I am yes. I am under stress here because of strict uh, rules and the protocols that we have at the University of Malaya or other universities that they are main research universities, honestly. When they are research yes. universities, it means that the nature is focusing on pure research and the researcher should be trained in order to be aligned with these kinds of universities. Otherwise, impossible to achieve. You, you know better than me, Dr. Heydar Shah, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> very right, very right. And you reminded me the whole episode of uh, three years over there in University of Malaya. And you are very right that actually there were very strong pressures and those pressure were, were very good for us in order to be polished, in order to be prepared. Because I believe that those pressure actually shaped us in a way that we are right now. And I think uh, we were very uh, pushed towards uh, reading different books, going to the uh, University of Malaya library, particularly thesis unit, where there is a pin drop silence, where you, have, you are supposed to read the thesis in order to understand the previous arguments, the previous claims, the previous work, methodologies, and all those things things i think that that shaped us a lot because we learned through literature review we we understood that how to build an argument how to find the research gaps how, how to contribute theoretically practically uh, managerial point of view and policy making i think they all of those pressures were just to make us more refined and there is no uh, no growth without pain and you are right that it was a kind of pain, but that was necessary in order to uh, make us what we are today right now. And the way you are a wonderful exactly. expert and exactly. now sharing wonderful knowledge with the, uh, with the uh, whole globe Thank is you. just because of the University of Malaya guidance that uh, they shaped you in that way. They give you the environment where you could grow yourself, where you have learned a lot. And that's why you have these kind of exposures and understanding. I think that is very much visible in your personality, in your tone, and in your content as well. And I'm just Thank enjoying you. because we are from both uh, University of Malaya, graduated from there. So we can understand and we can relate the things and the experiences we have gone through. And now uh, being a, a supervisor myself, now I understand that these kind of experiences are very important in order to grow further. Because at that time, we did not understand that why the, we are being pushed that way. But later on, we got the notion that it was necessary for our uh, professional growth and professional career. Uh, exactly. So, and That's I really right. like that. Correct. Yes. That is also, I want to add one more point. Okay. When sure. we are doing any or conducting any research or any project, it is not only the matter of ABCs or basic principles of research. The, another point or another element that is very important, it is the attitude of the researcher. The attitude of the researcher comes from our beliefs, the belief that should be there, the belief of be, beliefs in, for example, doing the research accordingly, ac appropriately, following the ethics, following the, all the protocols that being defined by our experts, by previous researchers by scholars so they the roads already opened but how to take our steps on this road that is also important only basic principles of research methodology and covering these basic principles are not enough i don't think that only if someone cover the basic principles and no attitude no belief in true research and pure research or ethical research that is what's happening in sometimes, sorry to say that in some, for example, parts of the world that they break the rules of the ethics and do everything against science, against scientific methods. So this is very important how to believe truly in research ethics that bring us to this level. Otherwise, only ABCs of basic principles of research methodology, for, from my understanding, not enough. 
Very true. Very true. Thank you for highlighting this important issue. And very rightly, you have pointed out that uh, we have been trained in uh, that positive attitude and belief systems where we have to contribute ethically. And this is what uh, our supervisors, they usually uh, tell us that uh, this is what you have to perform. Ethically, you have to be uh, in a way that you contribute better to the society and to the field. And I love exactly. the way you just uh, uh, gathered these slides, the content, which was very simple, but at the same time, you were explaining in a wonderful way that I really enjoyed it. And I, 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 I just was wishing that uh, uh, I wish I had the same presentation before joining the University of Malaya. It would have made my life much easier over there because we learn very hard way. And you know <laughs> this way as well. Uh, okay, since we have already reached our time, so let me just quickly ask few questions. They are very interesting sure. questions. You have already addressed it, but uh, uh, they need your further explanation to it. Uh, the sure. first question is related to the challenges to the uh, research methodology that what challenges usually you find as a supervisor so let me just uh, bring the question to the screen uh, the question is uh, uh, prof how can you anticipate and address potential challenges or pitfalls associated with the, your chosen research methodology yes please that is that is also a very good question and uh, one of the highlighted questions that always my supervisees, PhD students coming to me, even um, at the bachelor level, because we have final year project uh, for bachelors and also for master's students. Uh, you know, sometimes our supervisees and also our final year project students being puzzled and confused to, they don't know which road to take. And they cannot, um, they can't have a, a crystal clear picture of, okay, should I do interview or should I take questionnaire, for example? Is it survey or no, it is experimental, for example. Th these kinds of questions always are there and very highly questioned. The rate is very high. And uh, uh, from my understanding, the first things, uh, first things first. Uh, we need to identify, okay, our uh, main uh, interest and intention of our research. What we are going to do, you know. Uh, I, I, my first meeting, after actually warm-up meeting, the, the second session, the second session of my meeting with my PhD students, I will ask simply, tell me in your own words what you are going to do. I want to know. Very simply. Then the, the supervisee and student will, will answer, okay, I want to do this and this and that. Then I can notice that this student, for example, wants to highlight the cause and effect of several variables in their own environment, let's say in China or in Singapore or in Philippines and in particular manner. So I will sit down with my supervisee and ask, okay, let's develop our objectives first and based on the objectives okay that related and aligned with his intention with his topic with his team that he has chosen to do at the same time i will raise the question okay my dear what is the issue that you want to achieve this objective you need to have a very clear picture about the literature that what the previous researchers had been done and what they have discovered, what they have not discovered. So based on these issues or gaps or problems that are going to make our problem statement in our thesis, you need to bring for each objective at least one issue to tell to the reader and to the examiner because of this issue, because of this existing issue or gap, I am going to cover this objective. So as you see, these are kind of weaving sweater. Our old uh, ancestors always, when we were in the winter season, the old grandmas always weaving sweaters for us to wear in the cold weather in the winter season. Is you, if, if you look at the research also, this is exactly a weaving point. We need to weave all these things together. It's a kind of flow, flow of the work. 
It is connected to each other. We cannot say that, okay, topic is this and the objective is another thing. So we need to work on this in the same garden. We, I always give this example. You cannot go, for example, garden of the rose flowers and then suddenly jump to the tulip flowers. You should step in the same garden and walk in the same garden and highlight the issue and bring the objective in order to achieve find solutions to that issue and uh, distribute to your community and society. So that is the nature of the research, you know. When we are coming to highlighting the issue, to achieve this, uh, to find the solution and answer to this problem, we need to develop our objectives. When we write our objectives, definitely gradually we will choose our correct road to which methodology we need to go and approach and reach. I think if we come in this road and take these steps that I explain, it is very easy to get the appropriate research method and design. Otherwise, our students will be confused and they will be lost in the middle of the desert. So topic, theme, issues or problems. At the same time, think about how to achieve these issues that we are going to develop our objectives. And based on objectives, write your research questions, then I think everything then clear. Then when you are coming to the objectives, develop your objectives, you can see that, okay, this objective going to be quantitatively this as, uh, achieved or qualitatively achieved, which road? So if I am going to the more, more to meanings and uh, uh, people's or participants' ideas, opinions, or no, I want to go evaluate and see the cause and effect of this variable, influence of this variable in that variable. So definitely when we are clear about these roads, two roads, we can keep them in balance and put in our scale appropriately. Wow, very nice, wonderful, Dr. Azar. Your answer is so elaborative, so wonderful that you have already addressed the couple of next three, four questions because they were the same related to the how you can communicate effectively your chosen methodology at the same time. Another interesting question that what consideration should be taken account while setting the research methodology? I think that's the uh, wonderful thing that about the expert that they know what are the different things related to research methodology and then they try to cover it. Since your uh, content was powerful and it already addressed so many wonderful questions and you have already covered this one and we have the time limitation. It's already yes. one and a half hour. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Thank and you. Powerful enjoy, I am really thank happy you. to see you here. I yes, cannot see you. the others, but I am sure that you will have a group session photo, right? Later or maybe yes. not. I don't know. <laughs> but... Uh, if you let me just uh, permit me to bring my first slide, I want to take a screenshot for myself also. Is it possible? Uh, the first slide, the first one. Okay. Okay, this one. Your, oh, what happened? I need to go to the first one. Sorry, doctor. Is it possible to go? Ah, I found the, the easy way. Okay. Why? Suddenly jumps to the left Let one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, let us do it. Okay. Okay. You are doing right. Yes. Uh, I think there is uh, some issue with the software that's not bringing it. Yeah. I I, I clicked on one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, it is jumped Let to. Just bring uh -huh. it to one. That one. Okay, I did it. <laughs> yeah, very fast. Thank you very much, Dr. Hidasha. Thank you for your invitation, kind invitation. I wish you all the best and Thank also you. to our uh, audience, all the ladies and gentlemen that uh, were with me together tonight.
I am really humbled and thanks you. Thank you very much for having me tonight with this uh, in an interesting topic and uh, this international webinar. Hope to see you again, Dr. Hidesha. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, inshallah soon. And uh, Prof, at the end of the session, we ask our each guest regarding their message to the world. So what is your message to the world as a speaker, author, teacher, researcher, trainer, learner, educator, and professional? Yes, please. That's a very good question. <laughs> very critical one. I highlighted ethical approach and then uh, I believe strongly in ethical rules. And I think if all of us, all the researchers in this world follow these ethical rules and regulations step by step appropriately, we try our best to love and to be loved, to be uh, in a very peaceful world, no war at all, everywhere peaceful, and uh, because this is the maximum effort of the researcher. Why we are doing research? Because there is an issue, there is a problem, to find solutions. So find solutions for these real-life situations, I think, our responsibility. So all the researchers should feel responsibility to find solutions and make this world a peaceful place to all of us. No war for anyone. Thank wow, you. wonderful message you have given to the world, Dr. Azhar. Uh, really great. And uh, to the audience, that uh, please do follow our distinguished guest speaker through his uh, research work, and you can email him for future learning and guidance. He's very generous and always to help uh, people. So you can contact with him. We will be providing his uh, email address, and he's very much visible on the social Most media good. as well. So you can contact with him. So that's all we have time for today. And thank you once again, Dr. Azhar, for your wonderful thank time. You. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Wonderful... Yeah. Thank you all for your support and liking our session. Stay tuned as many sessions are on the way. Please do not miss any session. Till next session, take care of yourself. Bye-bye.